it's great to see it's great to see you <laughs> i've missed uh having a big crowd yes wave it's great to see your faces well half of your faces and i love this uh, swiss cheese shul that we've created lots of openings and uh a way for us to be safe here on this Rosh Hashanah. It means a lot. And those uh, on Zoom, streaming, or here in person, it's a blessing to have our community together in all the ways we can be. I've been imagining this moment for a year. A year ago, we held the most unusual service For the 12 of us who experienced it in our main sanctuary with our wonderful crew who's back here from Pi, it was a surreal experience, barely more than a minion. And given all the hardships that we've endured, I really expected this Rosh Hashanah to be more than the beginning of a new year, more than a moment commemorating creation. I expected us to be free of this dever, this pestilence that continues to afflict us. But alas, it has not happened. That is not to say that there aren't aspects for which I am grateful and amazed. I am both grateful and amazed I'm grateful for what we have done as a community, that many of us have been able to gather in various ways with friends and family. I'm grateful even though it has not been perfect. And I have to say, I'm also amazed. It is truly a modern miracle that the vaccines came into fruition so quickly and that so many have been vaccinated. As someone who believes that the divine flows through us and that we can be God's hands in this world, seeing this process of discovery and creation of a new medicine on a timeline that the world has never seen before at a time when the world has never needed it more, that's been pretty wondrous. And I have, everyone I have spoken to in our community who is eligible and able to receive the vaccine has done so. Thank God. Baruch Hashem. That said, there is sadness. There is loss. So many families bereaved, including my own. Some of these losses were unnecessary due to those who did not lead, due to people who did not take precautions, who did not heed medical advice, who did not organize quickly enough to distribute the vaccine to the most vulnerable. And I am still mourning my father. And I'm appreciative of all the support my family and I have received from our a Muna family. And of course, it's not just me. So many here have had losses due to COVID or been impacted in other ways by the pandemic. Too often, there was no closure when our loved ones died and we could neither be with them nor bury them nor mourn them properly. Until this summer, we could not say Kaddish in person I felt that loss most acutely for myself and for others in our community. In addition, COVID has caused isolation, exacerbated mental illness, substance abuse, and domestic violence. It has disproportionately affected those who were already most vulnerable. A month ago, I asked our community to reflect on this pandemic, to think about how it has changed us. Many answered thoughtfully from your own experiences, 
and I'll share a few. We have learned how interconnected the world is. Le tov u le ra, for good and for bad. Every human being can catch this virus. We are all vulnerable. And at the same time, we can track a pandemic and share information around the globe, something that would have been unfathomable 100 years ago during the Spanish flu. And there have been these other challenges, isolation, depression, the loss of communal singing, and the in-person sharing and schmoozing. While these are of a different magnitude, they add up to give us a sense of who we are as human beings. There have also been some unexpected benefits. We have shared at Zoom Shivas. We have creatively adapted our traditions to the needs of this time and found new ways to be close. Zoom has allowed families from around the globe to be together, as well as attend lectures and programs from wherever they are. Who would have believed that more than 200 computers and viewers from places like New Zealand, Los Angeles, New York, Lexington, and London would be zoomed into classes on Israeli poetry by Rachel Korazim, who sits in Israel twice a week. There have been study weeks, and I even attended the Rabbinical Assembly Convention from an app on my phone. Holidays on Zoom, sharing, bring your own chair, food and drink, table, anything you need. All of these have never felt more inclusive and necessary. Some of us have enjoyed the extra time from less travel and commuting, helping us to focus on what is truly important. And as I've said, we as a community have learned to come together safely. So given everything, we have learned, where are we now? And are we there yet? But like the child who asked that question with a sense of resignation, I have to admit, I have no idea where we are in all this. This experience seems not to have a clear end game, but I know that we have learned a lot. I've learned a tremendous amount from all of you, from our community. I've learned about resilience. And I've learned about letting go. If there's one thing that COVID has taught us, it is that we have little control over our lives. There is a basic impermanence to life and to our existence that pervades everything. Or as the book of Proverbs said, Machshavot rabot belevish veitzat Adonai takum. Freely translated into English, humans plan and God laughs. Or in Yiddish, a mens tracht whom God lacht. It always sounds better in the Yiddish. Our rabbis explain it this way. Olam kiminhago noheg. The world operates according to its own custom. And then the Talmud brings an example. If someone steals seed for grain, the grain should not grow if it were a just world. It should not grow because it was stolen. But of course, the grain does grow. The world works by its own physical laws, not by some overarching divine control. Olam kiminago noheg. Here the rabbis admit that the universe operates by itself without intervention from above. Nor do we control it. Olam kiminago noheg, it operates on its own, and while we can do what we can, most of life is beyond our control. Even today, when we declare hayom harat olam, 
Today is the birthday of the world. We are aware of our limitations, that we cannot do everything. And while human beings are capable of incredible feats of discovery and healing, it is in the awareness of our fund fundamental fragility that we can begin to understand what we are. Humans do not control very much. So while we cannot control much of the world, and we've seen that over the last 18 months, let us think about what we can control. The aforementioned phrase from the liturgy, Hayom Arat Olam, which we recite after the shofar is sounded in Musaf, may be interpreted differently. Hayom, today, Harat, like the word Herayon, pregnancy, Olam, which can mean space, but also time. Today is pregnant with all time, with eternity, as the late Professor Gerson Cohen taught. It is with the eternal one, a sense of God's presence and a new beginning of time. If today is pregnant with eternity, then today is the day we can shift our own possibilities. In fact, every day, in every moment, we can start again, each of us building anew. Each moment can be a little sliver of eternity. Today we can make a new start, where even though that we are limited in what we can accomplish, but how do we do that? How do we start on that path? We can begin by knowing ourselves, which can help us awake, wake up, and notice our own thoughts and behaviors, thereby giving us more control over ourselves. The Kabbalah, a core of our mystical tradition, teaches that the most distant, the most unknowable aspect of the divine is the Keter, the crown. That is where God begins to have the first inkling of the idea of creating the universe. It is that first spark that begins a new thought that creates the universe, or in the language of physics, initiates the process of the Big Bang. This is similar to a scientist who sees a new way to create a vaccine, or a musician who creates a new song. Similarly, like God, we can begin the process of creating or recreating ourselves when we begin to notice where we are, when we have the first thought of that first spark of an idea of what we are thinking. We find a teaching in our Torah reading that can be helpful in this regard. Today we read about Hagar and her son Yishmael. After being thrown out of their home, Hagar is lost in the universe. And then, Vayifkach Elohim eteneha, Vatera Be'ermayim. God opened her eyes and she saw well. The source of all awareness helps Agar become aware of the water that was right there. Rabbi Meir Leibush ben Yechiel Michal Weiss, a 19th century commentator known as the Malbim, cites Maimonides and he writes that the well of water was always there. But before this moment, Hagar was unable lasim lev, to pay attention enough to see it. But now she was able to see it. She was at first unable lasim lev, to become aware. But then her heart broke open over her fear of losing her son. And then God entered it. She abandoned herself to the grief of the moment she allowed herself to feel fully, deeply. Hagar had enough awareness to acknowledge and feel the bottomless depths of her pain that led her to see the well, which was always there. 
That reminds us that we have the power within ourselves to see what is there literally or metaphorically. This phrase, la sim lave, contains layers of meaning. La sim means to place or to put, and lave is the heart. To place your heart into something is to give it all your attention, all of your care, all of your love. In this moment for Hagar, it was the full embrace of her situation that enabled her to save the life of her son. In the book of Psalms, God is described as the healer of broken hearts. Harofe lishvure lev. Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutz, the Kutzka Rebbe, the great 19th century Hasidic master, taught that there is nothing more whole than a broken heart. Perhaps that is what allowed Hagar to truly see, see and feel her situation. She did not push away her grief, but she embraced it, allowing the pain to enter her heart. Liftoach et alev is to open the heart. Opening our hearts is to feel deeply, and la sim lev, to place your heart is to be fully experiencing a moment. If we apply the Kabbalistic approach, the first step is to notice where we are and what we are thinking. Human beings have a tendency to struggle to be present in the present. When we were younger, perhaps the age of a toddler, we were totally in the moment, sometimes joyfully, and sometimes in a tantrum. As we get older, our minds wander. So let me ask, are you fully present here, right now? Perhaps your mind may be wandering. You might be thinking, how long is this sermon? <laughs> or did I forget to heat the brisket? Or, if you're on Zoom, can people see my overflowing laundry basket behind me in my box? The Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, elaborates on this idea in her book, When Things Fall Apart. Even when we are meditating, or especially when we are meditating, we are trying not to think of other things and to focus on our breath. But it doesn't work our minds inevitably wander. It's hard to maintain our focus on one thing when we are quiet. Distractions, other thoughts, feelings tend to rise to the surface. Chodron speaks of the moment when we realize that we are thinking about something else. While our mind has wandered, she invites us to the practice of gently noticing that we are thinking about something else. And simply to mark it by saying the word thinking to yourself, noticing a thought pattern, especially a negative one, can help us create some distance and not be as overwhelmed by the thought. Our thoughts tend to be looking back at what has already happened at the past, or they can be focused on the future, what am I worried about? Our long list of things to do. Usually it's most difficult to be in the present, in this moment. In our Torah, being fully present is indicated by one of its most powerful words, hineni. As Avram responds to God in tomorrow's Torah reading at the beginning of the narrative of the binding of Isaac. And again to his son, questioning the absence of a sheep for the sacrifice as they walk towards the place of sacrifice. And finally, when Avram responds to the call of the angel of God who orders him not to kill his son, not to harm him. Avram's triple response of Hineni is what enables him to respond first to God's order, then to his son's suspicion, and finally, to raise his eyes and actually see the ram caught in the thicket by its horns, 
which had probably been there all along, like Hagar's well. I suspect that Avram couldn't see the ram until he was no longer torn by his love of God and his love of his son, until he could focus entirely on the moment at hand, knowing that the moral action was not to kill his son. That simple act of noticing that we are thinking about something else or that we are anxious or that we are afraid reminds us that our minds can be easily distracted. And like the Kabbalistic concept of the spark of a new idea, noticing where we are and where our hearts are can begin the process of change. Awareness can lead to modifying our behavior. We don't have to be stuck in old patterns of thinking. We can create new patterns for ourselves. We can begin again. We can create new possibilities for ourselves. When things go wrong, which they inevitably will, we can forgive ourselves and others. A helpful approach might be to say, over, next, instead of holding on to the anger, the pain, or disappointment. Each moment contains a new world. This deeply relates to this pandemic. The pandemic has taught us, olam ki minago noheg, we cannot control the world, that we are fundamentally vulnerable, that the world will continue to operate often beyond our ability to change it. But we can control our responses. If we can develop our awareness of our thoughts and emotions, then we can begin to grow as people. We can create new patterns of how to live, and we can recreate our patterns of thinking. And that is also what this moment is about. Rosh Hashanah teaches us that we can reset and start anew. Both Hagar and Avraham become fully aware. They become present in the moment. Friends, while this year and a half has been a struggle, there have been some silver linings. Sometimes extreme situations like a pandemic can help us experience life more fully when we feel God's presence closest to us. It's often when we break open, when our laves, when our lave, our hearts are broken open, that we can let new emotions in, that we can realize that we are part of something greater than ourselves that we can be open and let God in. Hayom harat olam. This is the day to be fully here as we begin a new year with hope. We can appreciate that noticing how we are reacting or feeling is the beginning of understanding ourselves. And this understanding can lead to deeper growth. This is the response to olam keminago noheg. This is the response to this moment of uncertainty. Ultimately, our goal is to expand what is possible, to see things differently. This awareness helps us to realize that we do not need to be locked into the way things were. That first spark of awareness, of noticing, as in the creation of the world, is the beginning of a new world. Instead of berating ourselves or lacking a spirit of generosity towards others, we can notice where we are, la sim lave. We can have more control of ourselves than we think we can. Rosh Hashanah and its liturgy remind us that beginning with a journey into ourselves can propel us into the world, perhaps lessening the severity of the decree as we recite in the Unitana Toka. May it be a year of noticing, helping us to sustain ourselves, lessening the challenges of an uncertain world. While we see and feel olam kiminago no heg, when we lasim lev, we begin the spark of a new creation. Ken yiratzon, may it be so. And let us say, amen. Amen. Shana tova.